Greetings, all. Welcome to Aquarian Diary. I'm your host, John Irving. It is July 2nd, 2023. The following discussion was recorded over Zoom. We had quite a few problems with the audio volume, which I have attempted to correct as much as possible. It's not perfect, but it's audible. My apologies for the inconsistent audio. Today, I am very excited to have with me a special guest, Dr. Scott Becker, who is a clinical psychologist uh, with 30 years of experience. And just to set the stage, what happened was that Scott had made some really interesting comments on some of my episodes, and we started to engage a little bit there, and then we started to engage a little bit more directly. And, you know, I was fascinated by Scott's comments. And then our discussions just got more interesting. And I thought, well, let's let's do a discussion. And because you, Scott, do a lot of interesting things and you have a very interesting perspective. I myself have worked with academics, but mostly on the climate side of things. So they were more like earth scientists. And uh, no, I don't have a lot of experience with psychology personally, but Clearly, there's a lot of overlaps, and our worldviews are aligned in a lot of ways, in many regards. And I think we both have a lot of concerns and frustrations with what's happening in the world. And I thought your perspective and having a discussion about that and yourself might be helpful to people in my audience. So why don't you tell us, just give people a little bit of a sense of what your background is, what your focus is, what your perspective is and uh, you know why we're talking sure well the reason we're talking is because i was uh very happy to find your channel i i look at a lot i've been you know as an amateur studying astrology for about 20 years and i find a lot of personal readings on a lot of the channels but yours is focused a lot on the big bigger picture and your perspective on the issues that i've been thinking about especially for a book that i'm writing right now were very pleasantly aligned you know we have slightly different backgrounds and different foci but honestly um as a as a psychologist who's looking at the bigger picture and wanting to say something about the state of the world i couldn't be happier to be having this conversation with you so that's the reason uh i'm here my background is it's interesting um it's in clinical psychology. I'm from a traditional doctoral program. And a lot of the perspectives represented in the department I was in are very conventional. The majority were very traditional, very mainstream. But I stumbled into a corner of the department that was teaching James Hillman's archetypal psychology. And we were doing qualitative research. So in the hermeneutic tradition, my research was pulling on Heidegger for the philosophical background. So in terms of being an outsider within a sort of mainstream academic program, it was an interesting experience. And it wasn't really all that different than my background before that. So I'm, I, I think I identify as a rebellious <laughs> uh marginalized or marginal person and the the interesting part of it is navigating that difference so drawing on esoteric traditions drawing on jung rather than some of the other theories looking at indigenous perspectives looking at african psychology looking at eastern psychology and buddhist perspectives there was a lot of thinking that i got exposed to that was touching on my deeper background, which is really in literature and sort of cross-cultural studies. My grandmother actually was a was an anthropology professor. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of rooted in, yeah, I was I was rooted in a much broader, much more multicultural and inclusive tradition. So my my trick has been to maintain my mainstream credentials while continuing to develop my deeper and broader interests on the side. Yeah, and uh, now, of course, uh, when I think of archetypal subjects, I think of Jung. Mm -hmm. I don't know yes. much about Hillman, 
uh, at all, really. Um, I watched one interview you did that's online uh, with a discussion, but it didn't really go into, you know, what the framework of it is and, and right. how it relates to like Jungian psychology or what the differences are. So I get the impression that Hillman took it a step further, but I don't really understand how that, uh, what that looks like. Absolutely. So uh, Hillman was trying to become a novelist and was struggling and then had a really upsetting dream in the Himalayas. He was trying to have a transcendent dream and instead he had a humiliating nightmare about his mother and his grandmother in a bunk bed. So he found his way to Zurich. He had been reading Jung along the way, trying to become a literary figure, you know, a novelist. But he went to Zurich for training and therapy, and I think primarily as a patient. But he was extremely intelligent. And the tradition at that point at the Jung Institute was if you're really good at this, then you are encouraged to continue your studies and become an analyst. And he did. And then he became the first director of studies while Jung was still alive in the late 50s, early 60s. But he was American. He was himself quite rebellious. <laughs> and his gift was seeing through and deconstructing. So he started to do that to mainstream Jungian thinking while he was there. And I don't think Jung had a problem with that. Jung himself said, thank God I'm Jung and not a Jungian. So uh, Hillman was pushing on the boundaries. He was bringing in outside thinkers and he was challenging the orthodoxy, you could say. And he was eventually pushed out. There were lots of political, you know, maneuverings as part of that. But I don't think that that would be as interesting to your audience. But essentially, he left Zurich. He left Europe and returned to the States. He ended up in Dallas and eventually left institutions altogether and was in private practice in Connecticut. So his thinking differs from the orthodox Jungian model in a number of dimensions. The, I'd start with a metaphor, though. If Jung is sort of structural and classical in his thinking about the psyche, Hillman wanted to move away from the idea of the self. He wanted to move away from the idea of typology. He wanted to move away from the idea of integration. And his model, it's difficult to summarize because he was deliberately avoiding his own form of orthodox theoretical structure. But if I had to characterize it briefly, I would say he was someone who wanted to see through all phenomena to their underlying images and to remain in this tension between the symbolic, the sort of transcendent function that Jung talked about, and then the sort of imminent, specific, material world. So he he was drawing partly on Middle Eastern models. He was looking at a, a tripartite cosmology. So the transcendent spirit, the imminent world of matter and body. And then the third realm, which in some traditions is called the Mundus Imaginalis, and some of the metaxi, but the, the middle ground where the angels and the genie and the daimon, the daimones in Latin resided. So he's he's midway between matter and spirit. And he remains very metaphorical and specific in his interpretation, especially of dreams. Uh, but he, he got increasingly interested in things beyond therapy. So he started critiquing architecture and city planning and the culture of therapy itself, and the Western tradition, and Christianity, and his work, it's much easier to say what he is deconstructing than what he's constructing. He wanted to avoid literalism. He wanted to avoid belief. He wanted to avoid habitual thinking. So what he was after was the capacity to recognize whatever perspective one was in. So he took the dream as an example of that. The dream presents a scene, and he thought that part of the goal of working with the dream was to understand that the dream is deconstructing the ego. 
So he's very big on the death of the ego, mm. on the the descent of the ego into the underworld. One mm. of his central books was called The Dream in the Underworld. Mm. So he said, when we interpret dreams in the Jungian fashion, or the Freudian for that matter, we're pulling the dream out of the underworld into the day world, and we're trying to extract meaning from it. Mm -hmm. He preferred to have the ego descend into the dream and to realize that it too is an image. So he wanted he wanted our waking consciousness to become more permeable. He wanted us to become more at home in the dark. There's a yeah. famous passage from Dream in the Underworld that says, an imaginal ego is at home in the dark, moving among images as one of them. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a form of Gnostic initiation, almost you would say shamanic, but he stayed very tightly within sort of a philosophical or you could say Greek mythological perspective. So he didn't go as far south as as one might, uh, but he definitely verged on shamanic thinking. He just mm -hmm. didn't use that language. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't he wasn't that close to what Joseph Campbell was doing, although he, I think he respected what Campbell did. In, sort of, in terms of cross-cultural mythology. But he deliberately tried to stay within a Western model of non-dualism, so mm -hmm. the avoiding the split between subject and object. But he did not go into spirit very much. He, he had a distrust for transcendence. He tried to stay in that middle realm. And so I think he's difficult. He's difficult from, uh, from an esoteric or, um, you know, transcendent perspective a spiritual perspective but he's also difficult for mainstream psychology and even for the Jungians. but if if one can tolerate that that middle realm and the sort of the not knowing the the off balance the off center the eccentric the deconstructive then it's an incredibly fluid and useful model for a lot of things including cultural criticism and that's how i'm using it currently yeah. I'm using his perspective to look at how do we see the mythology of what's going on right now? How do we make sense of, you know, the chaos of the world and try to find some kind of underlying mythological structure that that might help us cope a little bit better, if not if not change it? I kind of share your pessimism at times about, is, is the world going to get better? Uh, Hillman himself, uh, by the way, was opposed to hope. He thought it was the last evil to come out of Pandora's box. <laughs> because we, we could was, do a whole episode on that. Yes, for sure. Uh, it, it's hope for the wrong thing. It creates a passivity and a wishful thinking and sort of right. a childlike yeah. uh waiting, waiting for Godot, you know. So he he was more about dealing with what is. Yeah. I I can give you a very uh, contemporary example of that. Yeah. So Joe Biden basically was interviewed on uh Nicole Wallace's show on MSNBC yesterday. And he was asked about whether they should appoint more judges to the Supreme Court. And he's basically, um, I'll just summarize it, but he basically said, he, he said, it's too risky. You know, it'll just, it could unleash a tit for tat kind of thing down the road. And, and the scholars that he consulted basically advised against doing it. And then today, Trump comes out and basically says, oh, let's appoint six. If I get elected, I'll appoint at least, let's appoint nine new su Supreme Court judges. Yeah, I saw that. Maybe nine, he said. Yeah. And I'm like, well, there you go. Like, what the hell? Like, you know, uh, Biden yes. is just what, is, is just assuming that people are going to behave nicely. <laughs> They're not. Like, and there's no evidence to support that for years mm. now. Anyway, None. I don't want to diverge None. from from your topic. But I mean, that's that kind of wishful, hopeful thinking that just kind of drives me crazy sometimes. Well, absolutely. And I think that's the question is what what perspective should we be adopting? I mean, obviously, there's more than one legitimate way to look at this. But which perspectives lead to engaging the reality of the martial fight that's going on, the power for control in the states, for example, or the, yeah. the fight between democracy and plutocracy? Yeah, or, it's or existential. It, it's it's 100 percent existential and i agree with what you've been saying about environmental issues and the sixth extinction event we're in we're in deep deep trouble Absolutely. and to play nice to play nice is either disingenuous or somehow tacitly colluding with yeah. the status quo yeah i you know? i have i have stated here before uh if not on my own channel in in an on irish granny tarot's channel uh, that 
Um, I have wondered if there are like moles within the Democratic Party or whatever, because they just seem so facile sometimes that you go like, OK, this has to be intentional. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. And and we look at Biden's history of voting for every war we've ever had and making Delaware a very friendly place for BlackRock. Yeah, it's like lessers of evil, right? Absolutely. You know, but so, yeah, I wanted yeah. to ask, I wanted to ask just for the listeners, like when did Hillman sort of appear on the scene? What time period was that? Right. So he left in the 60s and his big breakthrough book was nominated for the Pulitzer in the mid 70s. So he gave the Terry lectures at Yale. Right. In perhaps 73. Okay. And he that was his magnum opus. It's called Revisioning Psychology. It's absolutely worth reading. It's it's a difficult read in a way because it's extremely dense academically in terms of his references. There are many, many footnotes. And he basically did a deep dive into Western history in support of what he was doing, which is taking psychology out of a framework that says we're focused on the mind or we're focused on behavior or we're focused on relationships or emotions. He basically used a strain that runs through Western history to say what we're really looking at is imagination and what he called it a poetic basis of mind. So rooting, rooting psychology itself in the imagination, that mm -hmm. our theories have to be imaginative, that our theories have to be non-literal, that we can't take any structural position on psychology without reflecting on the archetypal perspective that informs it. So theories themselves are understood to be expressions of the psyche and imagistic and essentially a fantasy. So he grounds psych psychology in the psyche. Were his principal experiences with Jung in the 60s, like around the Pluto-Uranus conjunction time, like mid late 60s? They were slightly before that. They were slightly before, but but yes. Um, and, and I was born in that period of the mid 60s. So that that rebellious earth shaking stuff is is in my dna i guess but um, well yeah we're still we're still now dealing with the consequences of all of those uh yeah. dramatic profound change thank god because it would it would be hell to live uh, before then but you know it, right, it right. ripples through generations it does and and it's interesting to see that he there was kind of like a wellspring that he tapped into in that time frame that that and and another thing i don't understand is is there a significant following his of his within practicing psychologists in that community? Not in the U.S. It's pretty marginal. It's not taught in most mainstream okay. Okay. clinical training programs. There is an institute in Santa Barbara called Pacifica Graduate Institute that has his archives, and they teach a version of his stuff, but it's not exclusively archetypal psychology. They're growing on a number of depth traditions there. And there have been some other programs that include it, but for the most part, he's even more marginal than Jung. So you have okay. you have Jungian psychoanalysts in the States, certainly, but there's not Hillman, this is in keeping with what I was saying about his theory, but Hillman did not create an institute. He did not want it to formalize, he did not want it to concretize or or become stuck. So that's one of the struggles some of us have who are still working that fertile ground is where do we do this? Is there a place? Is there a way to hold the tension between teaching it and having it calcify? Yeah, because you don't want it to just be a purely academic thing. Right. But in other countries, he's quite popular. Mm. He's popular in Italy, in Brazil, in Japan, uh, parts of Europe. So he's his ideas are more popular outside of psychology, too, than they are within it. One of Hillman's books in the 90s was called We've Had 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World's Getting Worse. Huh. And the format was an interview with a journalist named Michael Ventura. And they that was a free-for-all, back-and-forth discussion, I think conducted in multiple ways, somewhere in person, somewhere through correspondence. But essentially what they did was tackle the state of the world at the time. And one of the main ideas that came out of it was that psychotherapy was becoming increasingly self-referential, solipsistically self-absorbed, narcissistically focused on itself, 
and on the past and on childhood, basically on the personal, at the expense of recognizing that the world was in chaos, that my personal childhood is not the biggest mess that we have to deal with. So he, he was saying, can psychotherapy become a self or revolution? He said that explicitly. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty radical. And it, I, it got some attention, but I don't think it had as much of a ripple effect as it should have. And I don't believe that mainstream American psychotherapy has really heard the critique or really considered the extent to which, for example, we can say depression is one of the results of oppression. And that anxiety yeah. is one of the results of a manic consumerist capitalist culture. Yeah. So I'm I'm currently just kind of extending that idea and saying, all right, if we take an archetypal lens and we look at the world now, essentially 30 years after that book was published, and we ask the same questions, he was, I, I don't want to say he was trying to be prophetic, but the themes he identified are, have certainly amplified over the last few decades. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I was thinking about this before we started our conversation today. And uh, and I've stated this, you know, like sometimes you have to say things a few times before people hear you, you know. Um, That's right. But um, I like our this our our way of being, our civilization is a complete catastrophe. Yeah, I listened to one of your recent uh, videos on that subject, and I found myself in complete agreement. I mean, it's it's the theme of the book I'm writing, and what I've been saying is we we should look at where our current paradigm comes from. Yeah, and that's that's where the mythology comes in. I'm looking as far back as we can beyond Greek and even Egyptian mythology and looking at Sumerian mythology and saying, you know, the ideas of land ownership, uh, divinely mandated royalty and money and yeah. the split from the earth, the split from nature, nature and and whatever cultures were there before that that were more sustainable, more integrated, more shamanistic, more focused on wisdom and knowledge of energy and layers of reality, what we basically got was a top-down hierarchical, patriarchal authority based on the mythic battle between Enlil, who's the god of the sky, and his brother Enki, who's the lord of the earth and the water. And guess who won the battle? So we we've been living in that top-down detached exploitative structure for thousands of years and it's so far back that we don't usually remember it or question the origins or you know reach something resembling collective conscious awareness of where all these broken ideas come from well i you know i i mean i it is i mean we agree about this so yeah clearly we, clearly you know we don't need to debate that but I would think that a lot of people would hear me make a statement like that and think I'm completely nuts. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and I'm not, and I don't have academic credentials in front of my name. So, you know, I, I can go around saying stuff like that, but you do. Well, I'm not really all that academic anymore. I don't work at an institution. True. I, I guess left so. higher ed about five years ago. And, and I had been trying to change that system from within, but, as you've said on your channel, all of our institutions and traditions are based on this wrong-headed paradigm, including higher education. I think the it whole thing, like, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned money because I think the whole monetary system is uh, like a means of, you know, enslavement or maybe indentured servitude, and it seems yes. to be getting worse now with like the whole stu why does students have so much debt and you know i can yes. uh, i can think of all kinds of reasons why you would want to keep people in a position where they can't go out and do things like protest exactly if you're too scared of losing your job to go to the voting booth or if you're living in your parents basement or whatever yeah half of 20 somethings in the us live in their parents basement so uh, well, maybe not the basement, but they live with their yeah, parents. Yes. If, if if you're too busy trying to survive, you will have no time or energy or safety to try to change the system. Yeah, and and if you get like a negative mark on your credit rating, yep, 
it can impact you for years, right? So their yes. system has these forms of control and punishment built into them so that people do not stray from the orthodox paradigm, with the, the very paradigm that is literally destroying our planetary biosphere. Exactly. And when the education system is designed not to create contextual awareness and analytical thinking and to question authority, but rather to receive whatever facts, so-called facts, are put in front of us, then we don't even have the capacity to notice that the system is essentially enslavement and exploitation and destruction. Well, it's, e it's even more overt now that Republicans yes. are out with all their book banning and all that crap, because basically what they're saying is that anything that questions orthodoxy has to be killed or, or buried, right? Yeah, exactly. The, it's it's overt now. It's, it's, like, it's in your face. Like, yeah, they lifted no... the veil. Yeah. yeah. They're saying the quiet stuff out that. loud, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, if Apocalypse yeah. is lifting the veil, then the veil has been lifted. Yeah, and, and nobody is, can dispute that, right? That well, you, you know, no. some people would argue, oh, it's culture wars and everything, but it's it's not. It goes way deeper than that. Yeah, and I I think in some in some countries the the education system is better. Yes, ours ours is based on well, really. The argument would be all of Western education is based on the Prussian model. There's a great summary, by the way, in a book by uh, an Aboriginal academic in Australia. His name is Tyson Yunkaporta, and his book is called Sand Talk. And he summarizes the history of Western education by going back to Prussia and their defeat by Napoleon and their desire to indoctrinate all of the youth into being essentially soldiers. The joke in the book is that Prussia was an army with a country around it. So uh, the the education model was indoctrination and deference to authority. Yeah. And and that was adopted first by the US. Yeah. Well, and then yeah, by well, Europe and yeah. Well, one of the most the most curious aspects of it is is that there's a significant portion of the public of the uh, population that um is not just uh blissfully ignorant about this but they're like actively engaged in perpetuating this system absolutely and what the hell is that about i mean you're a psychologist what's your perspective on that why why would anybody why would anybody be out there fighting like i've called them useful idiots for plutocrats uh yeah, well fair yeah. what, what 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 is going on there with that mindset well, I mean, I, I understand a little yeah. bit about the authoritarian personality type, which I don't really understand, but I, I understand it intellectually, the framework of it, but I don't, like, I can't put myself in that position because I'm I'm not like that. But, you know. No, what, that's what, very hard. It's, it's, it is hard because you'd have, be having to drop big parts of your own awareness in order to do that. So empathy for that narrowness of thinking and that aggressive kind of thinking is difficult because it comes from a very lower part of the nervous system. It comes from a more primitive place. So. It's multifaceted, but basically, if you educate people to believe rather than imagine, to receive facts rather than see through and question authority and, and analyze, then you already have a receptive, passive, compliant audience for the political and religious propaganda that people get swamped upon them in this country. Mm -hmm. So, so it starts with that. It starts with that with a deliberately impoverished intellectual capacity to see what's happening. But beyond that, the propaganda in this country, and this goes to, I, I believe we had a brief conversation with this on your channel, but there's a BBC documentary called The Century of the Self. Right, I've seen it a few times. <laughs> yes, and, and it, it basically outlines the ways in which... It's like a mania, right? Started. Yeah, it, yeah. Basically, Wilson wanted to get the U.S. involved in the war, in World War I, and the U.S. population was very separatist at the time. So he calls up, of all people, Edward Bernays, who was Freud's nephew. He was in Toledo at the time, and he was representing Enrico Caruso, I believe. He was at an opera concert. But, but President Wilson calls Freud's nephew and says, hey, I hear you understand Freud's theories. Could we use that? to manipulate the entire U.S. population into joining the war. And he agreed to, and he came up with that slogan, making the world or keeping the world safe for democracy. 
and it worked. And then he moved on to Madison Avenue and was using it to sell cigarettes to women. They were calling them freedom sticks because they were selling them at the time of the suffragist movement. And basically then you have a hundred years of refining that that's yep. become even more weaponized as they moved it into psychology labs. There's a guy at Stanford named BJ Fogg who teaches web designers to make their technology addictive. There are classes you can go to to make apps and social media platforms more and more addictive. They call it the race to the bottom of the brainstem because they're bypassing conscious rational thought and they're activating a much more primitive part of the, you could say the nervous system that's fear-based. So if you induce fear, if you induce fight or flight, then you're more avoidant, you're more likely to hide from reality, and you're more aggressive. You can you can put people in fight or flight, and then you can aim that as anger at an imagined enemy, which can be anyone. It can be anyone who's not like you, the other. And they know how to do this very well. Well, I mean, this occurred in Germany, you know, Absolutely. prior to World War II, right? So it predated even that. Yeah, it's it's a model that's been used by authoritarian regimes for a long time. It's just that it's gotten mm -hmm. a little bit more. Yeah, and they they now have technology to track everyone's behavior online. They, every movement, every article you read, every comment you make, every, every... move you make, every breath you take. Yeah, yeah. Have Have you <laughs> yeah. read Naomi Oreskes' book, Merchants of Doubt? No, she's a professor of science history, and she goes into how the fossil fuel industry used the tobacco company playbook to undermine the science of climate change well that sounds entirely plausible yeah i mean it's just another example of how yes. propaganda and uh, manipulation is being used. but but let me ask another question because i i'm sure i'm not the only one thinking this or when people listen to this at least how come some of us seem to be more immune to that than others well, some of us were <laughs> raised differently. Some of us have different nervous systems. Some of us were raised in a tradition that says you should question authority. You should think about what's said to you and look for evidence. Some people were raised in more egalitarian homes that are attempting to inoculate them against the authoritarian culture that you live in. So you, you get your children ready for school by saying, you know, not everything they tell you is necessarily true. And you're allowed to raise your hand and ask questions. You're allowed to come home and talk about it. So not everyone is being raised only in this hierarchical paradigm. But yeah. also by temperament, some people are calmer. Some people have a stronger what's called vagal tone. The vagus nerve is the main connection between the brain and the body. Mm -hmm. And if, if it's well-developed through, for example, yoga or meditation or movement and exercise, or social interaction, it strengthens the size and connectivity of that, that regulatory system. If you think of the sympathetic as the alarm system and the parasympathetic as putting on the brakes and slowing it down, some people have a much stronger capacity to put on the neurological brakes. Yeah, and, and I mean... More resistant to being put into fight or flight and blind reactivity. I I do readings for people sometimes like all over the world, you know, and yep. sometimes we end up chatting even after we just because we connect. Um, yeah. But I've spoken to a lot of people who grew up, like, for example, in really red areas, but they're very progressive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like yeah, they they're, is... they stand out from their, you know, they weren't um, they're not kind of victims of their community culture. No, that's right. There, there are people in stereotypically red parts of the U.S. who are quite progressive, quite independent thinkers. They haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, and they do resist. The other thing I was going to mention is uh, within this theory of trauma and fight or flight, they've added another F to the fight, flight, or freeze. Actually, they've added several, but one of them is fawning. Fawning? So when we're put, when we're put, yes, fawning as in yeah. Uh, being sycophantic, right? So, yeah. So to to survive. Oh, that's so weird. <laughs> yes, to survive, <laughs> one will 
one who's in fight or flight, instead of freezing, can seek out a large predator. They can find an authoritarian leader who talks and acts like a bully, like a monstrous, aggressive, authoritarian figure. And they will line up behind him, usually him, in order to feel safe. And it's done in, in the context of an abusive household. This is you know, mainly referring to the, the child that decides to get behind the abusive parent so that the other siblings will get hit and not them. Wow. So on a collective level, that's my current line of thinking is that fawning is a is a political move that a lot of people adopt because they they also perceive that the world is becoming more chaotic and scary. But well, they they're not wrong. That. They're not wrong about that. But, no. <laughs> but they try to line up behind their monster who will protect them from the other monsters. And that's obviously foolish. But from that primitive form of thinking, it sort of makes sense. Right, it does. Yeah. Uh, and then and uh, there's another uh, element of the authoritarian personality type that I, I found particularly particularly disturbing, which is how they like literally enjoy causing pain to other certain people. Yes, and one of the models I'm bringing into the book that I'm writing is, is this broad line of research called the Dark Tetrad used to be called the dark triad and it refers to the traits of of psychopathy or you know absence of conscience right. narcissism and sadism or machiavellianism the the four include those four but they all have in common some form of callousness and disregard for the rights and needs and feelings of others and some the sadist personality especially r- really takes pleasure in the suffering of others. And I, th- I think the interesting thing is this, this model is from mainstream academia, mainstream social science and psychology. But I, I wonder to what extent from an esoteric perspective, what we're talking about is something even more insidious, you know, someone right. who's less and sold, someone who's perhaps controlled by extra dimensional energies. We don't really know. And those two camps never talk to each other. But I'm kind of situated in between them because I've been following Hillman and his much broader and deeper thinking. So so I ask those questions. I don't have answers. Right. But I, I wonder when we talk about evils in the world, whether we're talking about lowercase e or yeah. possibly uppercase e. Well, I mean, I, I personally have had experiences that I like. In fact, I, I, I think I even did an episode once called Does Evil Exist? And... I mean, intellectually, at least, I mean, I mean, yeah. if you look at what's happening in the world and what has happened and, yep. you know, I mean, it's pretty hard to deny that it doesn't yep. right now, but some people in the spiritual community will say, oh no, there's no such thing as evil. And I'm like, wait, so right. you, what, so what, so what you're saying is that all that stuff is like good. No, it's not. <laughs> right? Like, come right. on. And philosophically in the, in the sort of um, intellectual or philosophical tradition, Evil was thought of as the privatio boni, the absence of the good. Right. Or at one point during the Enlightenment, the absence of reason, because they thought that morality resulted from reasonable, intelligent, logical thinking. And if you thought that way, of course, you would do what's moral because those things are the same thing. Right. But then they would run up against what we now understand to be psychopaths. Yeah. And they they were confused because... There's no rational explanation for that, right? That's right. So, so there's a book by um, a colleague of Hillman's, actually, from the Jung Institute, Adolf Guggenbull Craig. He's a Swiss psychologist. And his book is called The Emptied Soul. It had an earlier name when it was first published. But he's talking about lacunae, empty spaces within the psyche. And the one in particular that's to do with eros or fellow feeling and morality. And he's saying your intellectual capacity can be fully intact but you can be missing the capacity to feel and have empathy and compassion and remorse. And the mainstream research is caught up to that idea. That idea. That's basically what they're looking at is that some people are born, we'll focus on psychopathy. Some people are born with the structures that correspond to empathy and perspective taking and compassion, but they are essentially switched off. The, the neural pathways and the parts of the brain that 
help us feel what other people are feeling are there, but they don't use them until they deliberately switch them on and get a read on the person. And then they switch it off again. So this is what's referred to in the literature as cognitive empathy. We can intellectually experience or understand what the other person's feeling, but then we can use that information to manipulate them. And they feel no more guilt than a person does who's used a Kleenex and throws it away. The, the right, true which, the high yeah, high. I mean, you know, it's impossible for me. People are fascinated by this because it's so, yeah, it's so outside of our understanding that it's just, it, you know, people, like I said, people find it fascinating. It's understandable. Although, I mean, I tend not to dwell on those kinds of things personally because it's just too dark for me. But, well, uh, it is. And there are only a few people that can face that without flinching. I talked to a, mm -hmm. a profiler for the FBI once. I had lunch, lunch with her. Uh, when I was working at an institution and she and I were talking about this issue and, you know, she's one of the people, this is Mary Ellen O'Toole. She's one of the people that's interviewed on TV when there's been a mass shooting to help people understand what's happening. And she and I had a pretty interesting, pretty deep conversation about it, but she essentially told me, you know, I don't, uh, I have to get away when I'm not doing my job. And I think there are only certain people that can even do what she does, which is basically hunt the monster, hunt the predator. We're not all hunters. We're not all warriors. And and this stuff is very dark. And well, it can be PTSD inducing. Well, it is. It it absolutely is. And I think even therapists who don't encounter the predator hear about the aftermath. And there is vicarious post traumatic stress as a result of engaging with people who have trauma. There are ways to mitigate that, definitely. Mm. Um, but but if we're just experiencing empathy and not actively engaging with the person and thinking about what we're feeling then we can go down the same drain as the patient, as the client. Mm. So I'm working on resilience at a collective level. I'm working on developing a sense of community. Another of the Fs in that fight, flight, or freeze model is flocking. And this is a critique of Western understanding of trauma by, from indigenous people and from collectivist people, especially from Africa. And they're saying, you know, when, when we face trauma, we band together, we flock together like a flock of birds, and we draw strength from numbers and from community and from a sense of belonging and safety. And that's not really baked into the Western model. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about what would it take for us to start to reform local communities that help us feel not individually strong and strong-willed, because that's very much individualistic and rationalistic, but more, how do I feel like I'm part of the tribe, part of a and, and again, this isn't tribalism, but part of a community or the human community so that we actually imagine our, ourselves as being part of something much larger than we are. Because, well, I you know, there's, the I think there's, we feel as individual. Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, just, I think the sense of dread and existential overwhelming despair is because we're, we've been taught that we're separate. We've been taught that we're isolated and alone. And that mm -hmm. even when we have relationships, you know, everyone dies alone. Life doesn't have inherent meaning. So I think I think a collectivist worldview might help us face the threats that we're facing more readily. Because if we if we identify with our individual physical life, then we're not really imagining beyond ourselves. And I think that's what's necessary right now. Because if the end is coming, if the comet is going to hit, or the next virus is going to wipe out everybody. Or if AIs, there's so many threats. If, if we can't imagine beyond our own deaths, our own individual deaths, to some kind of collective generativity and sense of cosmological interconnectedness, then I think we do shut down. I, I think we we can't see beyond what's happening. Yeah, like Understand? that's the re that's like complete reboot. Yep. Well, it's back Which... to it's as you've been saying on your channel. It's this need for another paradigm. That's not hierarchical. It's not individual. It's not even focused on the material world. It's focused on the idea of multiple layers of reality and and something that goes beyond what we can see. Yeah, I mean, there. You know what concerns me that you know I haven't really expressed this. I don't think yet is that what tends to happen is when societies go through challenging periods, whether they're economic or there's conflict or whatever, I mean, that stress tends to put people 
um, and it make make people even more vulnerable to these kinds of concerns. <laughs> and yes. I don't, I think we're just going to be getting hammered by one thing after another for like decades at least. I think I think that the astrology that, I, as I understand it, as an amateur astrologer, the astrology definitely bears that out. I was looking at the idea of the great year and the fact that we're in winter. You know, you've you've pointed toward twenty. 25 and 2026 is significant years when Uranus and Saturn move on. But but yeah, that's just know, a small, that's just a microcosm. Yeah, that's you know, short that, term. Yeah, long that's... term. Yeah, we're in trouble. We're we're in deep trouble, and we're going to be going through a symbolic death and rebirth, if not a literal death. Like like the, the, there's there like even if we get constructive about the situation, it requires radical things to occur right if we exactly. don't get constructive and we just let things worsen the outcome is radical as well there's no way out That's of right. our current state that doesn't involve radical developments of some kind and and a sense of collective initiation in the sense that we have to let this thing collapse but in order to do that we have to stop identifying with it by the way there's a amazing book published by hillman's um James Hillman's publishing company, Spring Publications. It's by a man named um, Michael Ortiz Hill, and it's called Dreaming the End of the World. And he has collected, this was published possibly two decades ago, uh, two or three, but he he's collected dreams of people who experience the apocalypse. Their their dream is apocalyptic. It's the they're dreaming literally the end of the world. Mm. And he's trying to create. A, a slightly different framework where this is about annihilation of our worldview or of our ego or of our system, but not a literal ending. It's a transformation, but our culture doesn't really have that built in. We don't, we don't have a framework for, you know, like in, in the Dune series, Paul Muad'Dib going through the Gam Jabbar. We don't, we don't face death as an adolescent in order to dissolve our identity and then be reborn as something bigger and more connected. So yeah, I think collectively that's what we have to do. It's this this cannot continue. It is going to fall apart whether we do it intentionally and and mindfully or just passively and then chaotically and literally. I think that that's the big question is is the death going to be forced upon us from the outside or is it something that we can go through psychologically, symbolically, spiritually? I don't I don't know. I think that's a issue that we could that anybody could readily debate. But, but right. I do know yeah. that if we ignore it, it's coming in a much nastier form. Well, the, the truth is is that we should have taken dramatic action decades ago. Exactly. And the people in charge knew. Yeah, they did. Absolutely. They knew one hundred like even and it's not just we're not just talking about politicians, the intelligence agencies, the Pentagon, like they have known about this for many years. Yeah, we haven't even touched on the UFO UAP disclosure and whether that's a massive psyop or whether there's a lot of uh, information about the universe that they've been withholding from us. Well, yeah, that's uh, but there's some I've been uh, I've been kind of constraining my thinking as we've been going along because we could go off on so many different directions <laughs> well, at right. any and given I, point. I think that's the challenge. That is the challenge <laughs> is that everything is converging right now. And if we're not careful, we just shut down. Right. Like, I mean, you know, like literally what's happening in America right now is completely off the charts. Yep. This almost like an insurgency that's taking over the country from within. Um, this is historic mm -hmm. by any measure. <laughs> and, you know, it's still, I mean, the indications are that 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 the country might squeak through somehow but it's not guaranteed. No, it's not. And that challenges the myth of American exceptionalism. Oh, I think that's, as far as I'm concerned, that is like, that was out the, that was out the window when Trump got elected. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like Americans People probably don't realize that. It. Like, uh, like if you talk to, you travel or you go to Europe or whatever, I mean, they have a very different perspective on America than Americans do because Americans are kind of indoctrinated with this belief that you Absolutely. know and and there's many phenomenal things about america and america has done many phenomenal things but sure. 
it's like when you look at like the homelessness and uh, you know uh the, or the, the prison population yeah or that people end up living on the streets because they can't pay their medical bills and things like that and yeah, i'm convinced that the, the poverty universal health care is is the main way that we're enslaved to the corporations you, you can't leave your job because you won't be able to afford health care right especially if you have kids or something yep yeah so i mean you know like europe doesn't have that problem and here in canada we don't have that problem but uh we have other problems but um you know like the truth is is that like especially under the trump administration most of the world was looking on in absolute horror like you know people who stop to look at a car accident kind of do yeah there were a lot of uh cartoons and memes about canada and your your crazy neighbor to the south <laughs> right you know, and it's not over right no it's not over. well you know um okay so um by the way i i think i don't think you mentioned that you wrote a forward to one of hillman's books and so you interacted with him personally right per, like you had I some knew, involvement yeah i knew him um he and my mentor from graduate school met at a, a men's conference there was a brief period in the 80s and 90s when James Hillman, a poet named Robert Bly, and a mythologist named. Oh yeah, so so Bly asked James to join. I not personally, him. I mean, <laughs> right? But yeah, Bly Bly is an interesting guy. Um, very very grounded and emotional, and I think Hillman was the sort of intellectual contrast to that. And then Michael Mead was the third figure. And he is uh, an Irish American. He's still at it, um, but he's he's a storyteller and mythologist, and he's he's much more uh, martial in his approach and more emotional. But the three of them would hold these men's conferences. So my my mentor, my graduate school advisor, went to one of these things, met James. They got into an argument, and they became friends as a result of that. And then. Hillman would come and visit my graduate program occasionally. He was actually at my graduate school on September 11th, 2001. So I had dinner with him. Oh, wow. Time. And I, I, I met with him at conferences over the years. And eventually he asked me to edit one of the volumes of his collected essays. But he also asked me to be the psychological commentator in his biography. So I didn't write the biography, but I uh, when when I thought it was appropriate, I would suggest uh, an interpretation and a link between his life and his work. So I was <laughs> I was the first person to publicly interpret some of his dreams because he hadn't shared them before. He was very private, but he shared them with his biographer. So I found myself in the odd position of interpreting James Hillman's nightmares. Wow. But, and and he it's it's interesting that he asked me to do this because I'm in a sort of third generation status, you know, there's a whole generation of well-known people who are heavily influenced by his work who are about 20 years older than I am. He was about 40 years older than I am. So he picked, in my case, someone who was rather obscure or completely unknown really to, to jump in and start doing some of this work. So it was, it was a big step forward in terms of my writing and my public presence. Uh, but yeah, I, I did know him. And and the essay that I wrote for that volume, it's called Inhuman Relations, it's volume seven of the uniform edition of the writings of James Hillman. And and the essay covers some of the things that we're talking about. It it uses mythology to imagine a form of um contrition and and apology and I guess begging for forgiveness from Gaia, from from Mother Earth, mm. from the from the source of our being because we've basically been destroying everything. So it was, it was using the myth of Medusa and her pre Hellenistic Northern African origins. She was basically the prone aspect of the triple goddess in North Africa. And then she got co-opted when the Hellenes came in and conquered that region, her mythology got co-opted. James, uh, sorry, um, Joseph Campbell has a lot to say about how Greek mythology is is an overlay for a much older cultural tradition. But basically using Medusa as a symbol of this anger from the from the great mother. 
and what we might need to do to kneel before her. Appease her. Appease her, essentially. And and that's not necessarily... Well, that's what they used hopeful. to do. <laughs> yes, it is. But but I was contrasting that with, with this narrative of, you know, the mother is endlessly forgiving, and if we approach her, of course, she'll greet us with open arms and love and forgiveness. Perhaps not, you know, perhaps it's too late. Perhaps we've transgressed to such a degree that even she isn't able to mend. I, it doesn't freaking look good. <laughs> I mean, this El That's Nino right. that we're just uh, embarking on is going to be like off the charts. And uh, like exactly uh, the ocean temperatures in the Pacific now are so hot that the scientists are just completely freaking out because they like nobody expected it this to occur and we don't even know what the implications of that are because we've never experienced it before but we're going to find out in the next couple of years yeah there's been a cascading you know this as well much better than i but there's been a cascading effect and there are much, many more complex factors so that the computer models that they've used to predict the ecological shift have left out some pretty key ingredients and every time they add them in it gets worse so yeah, and th that's one of the things about the IPCC reports that you can pretty much count on is that in almost every respect, they underestimate the severity of what actually will occur. Um, you know, we're there was something that came out recently that they had to move back their projected date, move uh, what, forward their projected date by 10 years. I mean, that stuff yeah, happens all the time. So I think I think our science is well intentioned, but you know, the world's ecosystems are incredibly complex, and we can't. Possibly yeah, understand. because what happens is you have people working on the oceans, you have people working on the tundra, you have people working on the, yes. the rainforests, and you know they they can be very well versed in what's you know as best as po within you know reasonably possible. Uh, but then when you put the whole thing together, it's like on that level, there's just. It's there's so many moving parts. Exactly, it's that old parable about what the the blind men are uh, trying to figure out what the elephant is, and someone has the tail, and someone has the leg, and someone has the trunk, and they all come up with a different story about what it is. Yeah, but we're starting to see the whole elephant, and it's not. It's, <laughs> yeah, like it's like uh, you know you, uh, you 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 can't increase the temperatures of the oceans by that much and not affect things like sea ice uh yes. or antarctica or the greenland or like i mean it, right it, it, or the, the carbon that was trapped in the permafrost and now the planet itself is releasing its carbon it's not just yeah from our engines it's from the earth itself so well and not to mention the the viruses and bacteria that are trapped in the carcasses of these caribou from thousands of years so yeah the, the, the cascading effect that i think we're just starting to come to terms with yeah, that's what I, 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 you know, so I think that all of these kinds of things are just going to, they're just going to start undermining social stability, which is why I kind of think we're already starting to see the rise of a lot of these far right movements in Europe and in America and elsewhere. Um, that's my understanding too. I think that what's happening is that people are on some level freaking out because it's so unstable the situation and Even folks who are not paying attention to the news cycles have an animal sense that something is wrong yeah well a friend of mine yesterday sent me an image from virginia and she it was demonstrating that she couldn't see the mountains because of the smoke from canadian wildfires uh, and she said that she was talking to an old timer down there who said he's never seen anything like this before right or the the indigenous people near the North Pole noticing that the pole had shifted. And then we recently discover it's partly because we've taken so much groundwater out of the earth that that's actually tipped the earth's axis. I mean, there, there are monumental things happening as a result of our stupidity or ignorance. That Yeah. And the, my point about the old timer is, is that, you know, these he may know no may not know anything about climate change but yes. you know you can look yes. in your local environment and you know there's like where did all the friggin' birds go like that i noticed that this spring like you know because the bird flu pandemic is in the wild bird populations i mean there's hardly any birds around like that freaks me out it freaks me out when i'm seeing all these species that never were here before 
It freaks me out when you see trees dying and it goes on and on and on. And you don't have to know anything about the science to know that like the ocean temperatures out here off the coast of where I am, uh, like even a few years ago, we're five degrees Celsius warmer than normal. The the fishermen are going, they have, they're like, what the hell's going on? Yep. Yeah, I think the, I think seeing is believing for a lot of folks. And I think the smoke here, I live in um, the northern part of the U.S., right? So the smoke here has been quite dense and the air quality index has been very poor. And I think it got a little bit more real for people, even those who've been reading the articles, because the fantasy is, of course, well, that's a problem for everyone else, but somehow that's magical thinking, but somehow that won't happen here. Yeah. People on the West Coast have been dealing with this for years, right? California and whatnot, but yeah, not on the I, East I Coast. It has to be an experience. Um, the problem is by the time everyone has the experience, it, it's essentially the, the train has left the station quite a while ago. Well, and these fine particles are actually quite damaging to the human body. So you know, they've done studies where people have been exposed to who have who are more exposed to pollution have like lower, significantly lower IQs and things like that. Yes, lots of things lower intelligence, including poverty and environmental factors. We haven't gotten into it, but there are lots of medical issues and, and neurological issues, especially in the younger generations that are coming up. And we're trying to make sense of that. You know, what what is causing all the changes in health and you know the autism rates and the presence of learning disabilities and the i personally think we're going to find and, that uh, that a lot of that is related to chemicals in the environment i agree and again the pattern is so broad that we won't connect all of the dots so i i think folks that are willing and able to look at this and to connect the dots whether that's astrologically politically or ecologically or psychologically, those of us who are willing to use intuition and to project forward need to be listened to. The people at the table in all these discussions should be, they should include the scientists, but they should also include people who understand things that are otherwise considered invisible or speculative. Because... Well, you know what you know what part of the problem is, and this this is a nice segue into another thing I wanted to was hoping to discuss with you is that, and I've talked about this myself, um, mm -hmm. is that there is so much BS out there, right? It's like we're yeah. swimming in a sea of disinformation all the time, and a lot of people don't have the critical thinking skills or whatever to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, and it's almost like that sets up a perfect storm so that we end up with the worst case scenario. Because if you can't get the public behind, say, tackling something like the environmental crisis, you're screwed. And that may be yeah. deliberate. Well, we know that disinformation is is deliberate by definition. Right. We don't know to what extent, but I agree. I think um, the the signal to noise ratio is terrible right now. Another title for your audience would be Trust Me, I'm Lying <laughs> by an insider who, who who was a propagandist for the big corporations. And he exposed what they were doing, which is essentially making up stories for the mainstream media. These things go out on AP and you know the, the broad uh, syndicates for, for news articles. But some of them are distorted and some of them are just flat out fabricated. And he wrote this book to expose that. But what happened was and he assumed that that would shut it down. But instead, what they do is in, within the industry, they use his book now as sort of the Bible for their, their sort of playbook for doing more. So he comes out with new editions, explain, look, they're using this ex oh, expose God. to amplify it. And and it really is disturbing to realize how much of the, the media are maybe well-intentioned, but, but definitely not accurate, not based in what we would think of as an adequate depiction of reality. So I think what I see among people I talk to, especially my clients is a, is a form of confusion and, and tentativeness. No one knows which sources of information to believe mm. no matter what the subject matter is. They're, they're not sure if it's true. There's a, there's a bracketing of all of the information they're getting, even the stuff that's probably well-intentioned and accurate. Well, it's it's for it, 
it's for this reason that this it's that I think that 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 disinformation is perhaps the biggest challenge facing humanity because yeah because it ties into action that's yeah it it yeah it um y- you know people are confused i mean the election of the former guy right like i mean yeah. it's all lies um yes and and you know like the the agenda of these like to me it's it's pretty much transparent but to a lot of people it's not um uh, and that i find alarming and disturbing because the kind of changes that are actually required right now are so substantial that what are you going to do lock everybody up and then make all these changes and say okay you can go home now like like we have to transition (laughs) radically we have to make radical changes and meanwhile people like don't even know what is up or down right and i think the fantasy for some people on the left is that couldn't we just have all the far right people go to one place and then they can have their own country there and the rest of us will try to <laughs> these are these are these are pretty active fantasies that people have and i i'm with you i don't know short of shutting the propaganda machine down and gradually you know because if if someone is in a cult individually traditionally if someone is in a religious cult they can be pulled out they can be deprogrammed they can reset Right. They can reorient to reality. I've had a few clients over the decades that have kind of been in that situation. And and it's definitely possible to get grounded again collectively. Yeah, like a hundred million people or something. Is, yeah, when it's ongoing, when they're immersed in the cult, essentially, the the altered reality. Yeah. Where, how how in the world would we unplug everybody? Well, that that's Unless what they, I don't I don't I don't get it. Like I, how does this get resolved? I don't that's where I get stymied. Right. Like, how do right. you solve this problem? Like, do, like, because, like, yeah. I, the polarization, in fact, like, as I, I did an episode on this stating that it's intensifying, right? And you yes, can't rationalize that. with these people. In fact, I've watched a whole bunch of videos recently on this topic of like, how do you, how do you fix this, right? And, it's kind of like when you're dealing with conspiracy theorists. Um, oh, what's that phrase now that people are using where they basically just like they'll spew so many mistruths in like a few sentences that it would take you like hours to to go through them all. And so they win just because they overwhelm you. Yes. Well, and, and it, it's a little bit like talking to someone who's actively delusional. And again, in the past, that was an individual who had something going on very specific to them. But now you've got a collective delusion yeah. or a collectively induced delusional state. And I, I think, honestly, that system has to collapse. I mean, countries have moved out of it. If you look at what Germany's done since World War II, I, I think some of it I, it's, it, there, there's a, There's elements within German society that are getting quite radical now. Yeah. As in true. Spain, uh, France... Uh, you know, there's there's these far right movements, even in the UK now, like this is it's disturbing, but it's actually happening. I'm not saying it's the majority of the population, but there's definitely an uptick in really radical movements everywhere. Yeah. And I, I would the, my the broadest framework I use for this is that, you know, kind of a spiritual perspective on an individual life We're we're born, we're we're temporarily embodied and we're here for several decades but not very long and then we return to the source where you know our we, we're temporarily in the material plane and then we return i think without that understanding without a circular perspective on the soul's journey i think the ending or the transition back to the source is experienced as overwhelmingly terrifying and so then fantasies of immortality come in very quickly actually Hillman's book revision and psychology lost the pulitzer to a book by ernest becker no relation to me um but the denial of death that that won the pulitzer mm. in whatever year it was 73 74 some, something like that and and basically he said we come up with immortality projects because we can't face our own death and so i think that's happening collectively i think we see the writings on the wall there's a lot of ending coming 
And I, I think the fantasy is that we can somehow insulate ourselves from that. If we, yeah. if we align with power enough, if we become immortal ourselves, we can somehow avoid this, which is crazy. It is crazy. Because it's not going to go down. Power. It's we not. That'll power. never happen. That'll never happen. No, it's. I mean, it's fascists I always like you know. There's like one person at the top. I mean, yeah. You know, and if they decide they don't like you, you just disappear. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they have no allegiance right. to anyone. They're psychopaths. Yes. Like and, look and at the look at the governor of Florida. Well, if you can, right. <laughs> This is why the book is called Facing Monsters, right? Because we have we haven't talked about your book, by the way. Oh no, should. that's okay. the book The book is the book is right along the lines of everything we've been talking about. It's called Facing Monsters, and it's it's an attempt to use archetypal and mythological imagery to make sense of what hap what's happening, put put a form onto this abstract chaos that's happening. And to talk about how we might get grounded and how we might come to terms with whatever endings and beginnings are coming. So it's looking at politics, it's looking at propaganda, it's looking at climate change, it's looking at the impact of digital technology and social media. It's looking at everything that's happening that essentially involves the feeling of being overwhelmed and existential dread. And it's trying to come up with a story and a set of images that let us slow down calm down connect with each other and try to make the endings less literal that's daunting and it's really it's not for everybody i mean not not everyone's going to read the book and it's, but for those who are thinking those who are brave enough to really look at what's happening i'm hoping that it provides uh, a set of uh, basically a lens is the image i've been using the metaphor i've been using is is a way to bring all this into focus that makes it more clear, but also less daunting. Because if we can imagine beyond ourselves, that basically is what it boils down to. You know, they recently there was an interview with Mol Gadot, who is the head of AI for Google, and he sees AI as a huge existential threat. And because he's Egyptian, he said he's been heavily influenced since the death of his son several years ago by the idea of die before you die. It's from the Sufi tradition. So he's saying we we need to do that. We need to accept that something horrendous and global may happen and then that allows us to live more fully to be more grounded and paradoxically to try and avert the crisis if we're terrified we're not going to be effective in our efforts to make things better so we have to come to terms we have to die before we die the ego basically has to dissolve and then what we're doing is for the collective it's for everyone it's for humanity it's for the planet that's that's a tall order. So the, the book is trying to offer in a in a pretty humble way to offer one one way of looking at all this so that we can psychologically cope better. So let me ask you something that huh, I've got to so I could go again, could go off in many different directions, but what is your view about the whole notion of an ascension that many people have in this spiritual community have been projecting um and well, I've, I've heard but, but uh, let me let it, me yeah. finish let me finish but just to add in a little twist to it because yeah. somebody on my channel recently commented and said what evidence is there for ascension and i said i said you know that would be a good episode but i haven't done it yet but i'm interested in what you think because because of course this is a huge phenomenon like there's people all over the world who believe that humanity and the planet is going through this this shifting consciousness to a, it's a major event that hasn't occurred in if ever, if tens of thousands of years kind of thing. And that this is a, a momentous time in human history. But if we look at what's occurring pragmatically, there isn't a lot of empirical evidence to support that. There's a bit, but not a lot. Right. And I, I think that that idea for different types of people means different things. For some people, I think it's, kind of a, a dissociative escape right an attempt to it sort of you know i saw an article as an undergrad 30 plus years ago um that gore vidal had written he had had a state dinner uh, where he overheard reagan talking about nuclear armageddon but he wasn't concerned about that because he would be taken up in the rapture <laughs> my god 
Thank God we yeah. survived his presidency. Yes. Well, yes. And but that, you know, so for some people, ascension means um, deus ex machina, that I, I will be lifted out of this place before everything really hits the fan and it won't right the rapture so, yeah right and so so there are two layers to this one is soulful which is more about living in this world and the other is spiritual which is about what lies beyond it so i i guess psychologically i'm focused on how we fully live while we're here i i don't have the same psychic abilities that some folks have my dreams are quite intense and sometimes very telling from a spiritual perspective but i i try to keep my focus on you know lived experience here and and for example my clients you know the people i connect with and that i try to offer some kind of wisdom and insight to so here's here's a a framework james hillman had an essay has an essay called peaks and veils and it's about the soul spirit distinction within the Western tradition and within psychology. And he quotes the poet Wallace Stevens, and he says, the way through the world is more difficult to find than the way beyond it. So it's kind of like saying, you know, even if you're a bodhisattva, Mm -hmm. you stay in this world to attend to the suffering of the souls that are still here. You don't, you don't leave out of indifference. You stay out of compassion. So I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm not a spiritualist. I don't know whether the ascension is possible. I do think it's possible to reach a deeper and higher perspective. I I do think energetically, by which I guess I mean psychologically, soulfully, I think it is possible to connect with what's beyond without doing a, a let's fly out of here before the wave hits. So I, I I don't know. I think it's a very important spiritual question, but I think the danger psychologically is if we hang our hats on the idea of the rapture, as Reagan imagined it, then I think maybe we're not taking this seriously enough. You know, what what is this world for? It seems to be, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh said it's uh, to awaken from the illusion of separateness. So if our souls are temporarily here to learn to, to remember, to recall, and to experience the fact that we're all connected, even, even while we're here, even while we're in this dimension, if we can experience something resembling universal love and interconnectedness, then maybe that is the purpose. You know, if, if there's a universal consciousness and we're the little bits of it that chose to be in this ridiculous three-dimensional plane for a bit, then maybe our task is to experience that here. Yeah, but that would have been true 400 years ago as much as it is as it would be today. Yeah, yes, I, right? I would I mean, argue that. The, the, uh, when I'm speaking about the ascension, I'm referring more to like the age of Aquarius type concept where Oh, humanity... I, I understand. I yeah. understand. I'm just talking yeah. about how that's interpreted and what that does to people psychologically. Oh, yeah. Like so, I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I mean, if we literally look at what's happening right now in the world, like right oh. now, at least at this, take a snapshot. Um, you know, there's been an uptick of interest in things like topics like astrology, and but you could also say that that's just because of platforms like YouTube. Um, you know, well, I think uh, that's helped actually. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that that is in terms of humanity as a whole, I don't see much evidence for it at all. Like we're we're actually in a retrogressive, we're retrograding some in many regards right now. It's regressive. Yeah, I think I think we're we're moving down the neurological and evolutionary ladder whether you think of evolution as scientific or or spiritual i think i think we are lowered by what's happening and then i think the challenge is can we hold that higher level of awareness and vibration within the mess even as it's happening and i I think i don't judge anybody who's not able to do that i think it's individually absolutely overwhelming i i just i think the goal is to to have these kind of conversations i don't want to be too reductive but but to engage with people who are trying to see beyond the immediate dreadful horizon i think that's valuable i think it helps us stay calmer and more grounded neurologically psychologically spiritually i I think we have to feel connected and I, I don't, I don't think I, I remember you're saying this in one of your discussions 
I don't know if it was the dichotomy paradox or if it was one of the other ones, but but basically to live in this world while we have this mm. firsthand experience of transcendent yeah. awareness. That was the that's, one. That's the tension. I think that's what Hillman was trying to do with his psychology was to create this middle ground so that we have a bridge right beyond the soul. The soul connects with the spirit. The soul also yeah. connects with the body and the material world and you know the veils, peaks and the veils. Like I, I literally personally um, had made choices in my life where I could have gone off and lived in an ashram and studied exactly. with a, and studied with a guru, right? And yeah, that's probably probably yeah, advanced right. spiritually way more than I have. Yep. Um, and I could have done that on different occasions quite happily, you know. Yep. Um, and you um, chose, yeah. Right. But I was guided, and actually, I was I was told through a someone I know who's an amazing channel. That I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> so, like, I'm supposed to be engaged in the world. And, but yes. it would be way easier to just go off and do spiritual work than deal with all this crap. Um, yeah. Way that's easier. The Stevens quote. Yeah. That, that's, it's easier to find the way beyond the world than the way through it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but, but what concerns me and has for very many years, and I even talked about this when I think I was in one of my recent episodes is that there's just general lack of awareness and engagement about these really critical issues. I mean, even like, for example, you know, Trump appointed three Supreme Court justices. Yep. And why did that happen? Because either people didn't get out and vote or they voted for the wrong person. Yes. It's that simple. Yes. I mean, so all of what's happening now and what might transpire yet, what's yet to come, I mean, can be traced back to complacency yeah i would say numbing hillman's term was anesthesia i think apathy uh dissociation freezing right I think but that's that's like but we're things. but what but what these what my point though is is that these these situations the circumstances are so critical that that it's that aspect of this scenario that terrifies me the most yeah like i mean it's yeah. like we should have done something about this, like I said earlier, decades ago. Um, and we're still not doing any, like, we're not even close to doing what we need to do. No, we're not. And I, I think I think we can blame capitalism and consumerism for part of it. Right. You know, so how does that end? Right? Like, we're either it doesn't people well. get entirely engaged and everyone goes like, holy shit, this is amazing. And maybe, you know, young people will come out and vote after all these recent Supreme Court decisions. That'd be great. But um and because the the democrats would need you know the house and the senate and the the presidency <laughs> to get anything done um yeah uh, i mean so let's hope that happens but that's not guaranteed but holy crap if i look at it just based on my what i read and rationally it like i said it just it does not look good right and 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 I, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm, i know i'm also sensitive to not like dwell on all this negative shit because people don't want to hear that because they find it depressing i happen to have enough you know whatever it is chutzpah to like be not afraid to look at it and see it for what it is there's a lot of people who just literally don't even want to look at it um because That's i right. think we have to right we don't have a choice um we don't have a choice if we want to be more fully alive while this is happening if we want to numb there are a thousand ways to numb out yes if that's true be, if we want to be fully alive or with our eyes open when when the change happens or when the ending comes we don't know which it is but if we want to be fully engaged and awake and alive i find that joyful i i know that's difficult for a lot of people to connect with experientially but i I would rather see what's happening and be fully engaged right up until the last moment. It's kind of like the quartet on the Titanic. I would rather be playing right up until the end. Yeah. Then, then to be comforted and and take the red pill or the blue pill or whichever it is in the matrix and, and disengage. I, I, I can't imagine not wanting to see what's happening. Right. And, and my, my goal is to help anybody, you know, I, I have a, I have a small, goal which is anyone who wants to talk to me or or read the book to help them become more awake and engaged it doesn't mean happier 
in the sense of more comforted, but it means fully awake and engaged and alive and knowing that I'm trying to be part of the change, even, even if we can't win. You know, there's a famous quote from Pete Seeger to Ani DeFranco. When he died, there was a long article and a lot of other musicians and celebrities were talking about his impact on them. And Ani said that she was talking to him about this fight that we're in with fascism or whatever you want to call it. And he said, well, you know, we don't fight because we think we're going to win. We fight because there's joy in fighting. <laughs> what a great, uh, that, that's a, that's a really interesting. Um, I love that guy. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting because a lot, like I'm fairly direct and confrontational and I will just like, I, I despise lies and I despise bullshit and I despise, I, I really just don't like things that are superficial. So I will come out and say things all the time that with a lot of people make me quite unpopular because, you know, for whatever reason, they just disagree. Um, but I'm like, this is what we have to do. Yes. We have to speak the truth. We can't deny reality. We can't deny the darkness. We have to confront it face on. And that the, the real problem is the people who are just pretending that it doesn't exist. Yeah, I agree. But I have... Um you know, Pluto Uranus in the 12th and I have Mars in the first trying my son and I'm, <laughs> I'm here to fight. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here to fight. By the way, my Mars in the first is conjunct the asteroid Medusa. Oh, nice. So, and I discovered that after I'd written that article, but um, you know, yeah, I think that that's what divides some people. But, but I think if, if we persist, then more people, We'll we'll hear what you're saying that we do have to that that the truth matters truth we matter more than life. Well, you know, the, individual lives. There's a lot going against us too because now all of these big players have been taking over these social media platforms and making them completely useless. The algorithms are against us. Like if you talk about climate change, mm -hmm. you know, there's like five strikes against you right off the bat. Yep, I've thought about that. Uh, but I, I mean, you know, so you can't even talk about it, right? <laughs> in other words. Yeah, that's right. But and and this is this is only the second time in social media that I've talked about what I'm working on. So I, I haven't really run into that buzzsaw yet. And I don't have social media presence per se. We have to get around that. That is absolutely critical. You know, when Facebook yeah. first came out, like in the early 2000s, it was actually useful. I made mm -hmm. and connected with a whole bunch of other people who were activists of different types. And some of whom became friends and still are dear friends now. Um, yes. th there was a shitload of engagement going on. It was really exciting and dynamic. I was meeting people all over the place. And then, of course, Facebook went and monetized the crap out of it and basically just made the whole thing useless. And look at what's happening with Twitter. And now YouTube has all these algorithms that penalize you for saying things that are true. And, you know, like it's like we, uh, I'm concerned about the technology because. You know, we could just be all disconnected. I've, I've talked about this before. We could just all become disconnected. Agreed. And the central control of that is the problem. You know, I think the internet, when they first designed it, was imagined as some kind of egalitarian populist. Absolutely. Force, but that's not what it's been. I mean, no, because it's been co-opted by it's by been co-opted yes. by money and and yes. pe and people who just all they give a crap about is money. They don't care about you know the kinds of issues that we care about. That's right. And and Facebook is becoming meta. So we're being seduced into the virtual prison. Well, meta, it, Facebook isn't even a platform. Like uh, there's tons of people nowadays who just don't even use it. Right. But what my point is, is that it was undermined. Yes. Right. And, and, and look at yes. look at what happened to Twitter in one year. Now, Elon Musk has a thing now where you can't even read tweets unless you have an account. Oh, I didn't know that. That's news to me. He okay. just introduced that in the past week. Yep. So, I mean, basically what he's doing is, and journalists around the world used to use it to communicate about important things. And it's that community is just gone, basically. Yeah. Right. So, uh, or, or it could be like a government like China, which just says, oh, you know, you can't use certain words or you can't uh, talk about certain things or we just throw you in prison. That's what they do in places like China. But in America, you know, they just take, the, they just co opt the platforms and suddenly, you know, people can't talk. Like, what's going to happen when, when the shit really starts hitting the fan, which it hasn't, but will? Um, how are people going to stay connected? We have a thing going on here in Canada now where, 
our traditional media is being completely eviscerated, gutted, wiped out. Like there's only going to be like a, a couple newspapers and sources of journalism left in Canada. That's grim. Because they can't compete with the business models of Google and their advertising systems. Right. They've been outmaneuvered. Yeah. So because, you know, like one of the huge, the biggest of things to the traditional media publishing industry was classifieds. They used to make money. Like that was a big breadwinner for them and that, that disappeared, right? The, uh, and like right. it's because of course you know whether it's facebook or kijiji or who or craigslist or whatever i mean it's just way more efficient my point though is is that we seem to be run at the same time as all this other stuff is happening we seem to be heading down a road where the flow of information is going to be limited and more much more tightly controlled by vested interests and that is another great concern of mine as well true and the the human population is so large and so widespread. How do we, I mean, it, traditionally you'd say, well, we would take to the streets. We would have a town hall meeting. We would get together locally right. and then we would, but uh, again, because the internet is designed to be addictive, you're asking people to disconnect from something that they almost literally can't live without. There are people that have panic attacks when they left their phone at home. Right. There's a book. There's a book we might recommend called Irresistible by an Australian named Adam Alter, who's an NYU professor, and he exposes what I was saying earlier, which is that this is all quite by design, and it's it's a good economic money making strategy, but it's also by extension a good way to keep people stuck in an environment that doesn't actually lead to political change. It leads to well, that, abs absolutely. I'm arguing that I think by different means, but we arrive mm -hmm. at the same conclusion. Ah, yes. So, we're, we're, right. we, we're so dependent upon these platforms who we have no control over. We don't even know what the algorithms are, how they work, what not, nothing. Like I could, they could shut down my channel tonight just by flicking a switch, and there's not a damn thing I could do about it. Not that I'm my voice matters all that much in the big scheme of things, but it's just to make the point that you know. We are profoundly vulnerable. Yes. Well, because... I think your channel matters to the thousands of people who listen to it. But but yeah, and this this may be the interview that does. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> yeah. I'll blame yeah. it on you. I know. You know, feel free. But, but the, <laughs> you know, the, every little thing does matter to whoever it connects to. And I, I think that's right. I mean, we've, we've given away control to that unholy alliance between wealth and, and technology, we, you know, the, the people who have control over this do not have the same value system. They don't have the same ethics or morality necessarily. Some of them might. Well, you know what I think happened? What, what I think happened there with the tech companies was that in the early days, they were kind of visionaries, right? But then the money, like the investors and the investor community and Wall Street and all, uh, they are the ones who said, okay, no, you got to make money. And that's, Forget all that other shit. All we care about is is making billions of dollars. And they essentially sold out. Is that the? Well, they don't have a choice, right? They if if you're choice. public, you have stocks, right? You're on the stock exchange. You have a fiduciary yeah. obligation to make money, or they can. It's written into it business law. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I mean, you know, uh, and so uh, you can be prosecuted. Uh, for not making money or for making decisions that are counterproductive. And so so it's not, there's nothing, it, it, the genesis might have been egalitarian, but they got taken over by the money interests, the Wall Street people, who are, there's your psychopaths, right? Essentially, there's good research on the prevalence rates being much higher. The higher up the economic and political ladder you go, the more likely you are to encounter some of the dark the trend traits. So I was just reading an article today in the Guardian about how there's a community that had was doing an experiment with the four day work week, right? And yeah. it was it was going fantastically. Well, then some minister comes along and says, "Well, you can't do this. You, you, I'm ordering you to stop doing this." Hmm. Even though we know it makes people more productive. Even though it was working and everyone was going like, why not? <laughs> why can't yep. we do this? Well, you can't you can't have people just working four days a week. Like, you know, he's obviously he's obviously speaking. He's a mouthpiece for, you know, 
the corporate class. Oh, for sure, because that, that extra day could be used to protest. Right, exactly. Like you can't have people sitting around not doing stuff. Like right. in their right. minds, yeah, right? You're like, yes. like in other words, they had tons of evidence that it was actually beneficial and everyone was happy with it. And then someone from above just comes along and says, no, no, you can't do that. Yeah. It's it's completely illogical, except from that twisted perspective. Right. If the goal is not just productivity and accomplishing tasks, but to keep us glued to our desks, then for sure. Yeah, there was another study years ago done in uh, Winnipeg in Canada here where they did a universal basic income pilot. And it oh, was right. They did that in the States too. Yeah. And it was phenomenally successful. Yes. 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 But then yes. they just canned it and then they just tried to pretend it never happened. Yeah. The world is not in danger of becoming Scandinavian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what we're up against, right? Like they're that's not going to come out and tell us this, but they want to keep things the way they are, even though it's catastrophically detrimental. Yeah. Briefly, uh, there was an article by a computer science professor about a very strange experience he had being asked to speak to a conference of very wealthy attendees. So he went there, they gave him, his, his fee was probably a year's salary, so he, he couldn't say no. So he goes and he's expecting to deliver an address that he's written, but instead they put him in a room by himself and a series of individual, we'll call them billionaires, come in and start asking him, how do I myself survive the event? And he said the event was right. I've not heard this necessarily defined. Yes, you've heard this. And but you go asking, on for the for other people. Go on, carry on. Well, sure. So, so they they were asking him, how do I, for example, upload my consciousness into a digital cloud so that my my mind, I, will survive the apocalypse? And how do I, if I'm living in my compound, and money is no longer a way to control my staff, could I, for example, have explosive collars on my servants <laughs> so that i could blow up their heads if they don't do what i tell them to do if they rebel and he was just stunned and astounded but he felt the need to share this with everybody but what was he said what was disturbing is they universally agreed that there was a very bad apocalyptic yeah. ending coming so they know this this is why they've been buying huge tracts of lands farmlands out in the country but bomb uh, shelters underground shelters they've been doing this building. for years well like you know just to i don't know how to wrap it up because i feel like there's so much more but um the dilemma is we have uh billions of people who are completely detached from reality in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. and they're on the hamster wheel in this capitalist system we live within and not likely to get off or be let off and, and one of the thing point i haven't made is that uh, as far as i'm concerned there is no way the economic system will be able to survive the onslaught of environmental feedbacks that are coming it's just physically it's like literally impossible right. so i don't know if that looks like some kind of depression or whatever but i mean you can't take like trillions of dollars of assets off the table without having some kinds of consequences and that's what's going to happen and that meanwhile the status quo is trying to preserve the status quo for as long as possible and using every means at their disposal including manipulation and deceit and propaganda um and the political class is completely at their beck and call and stymied so how like it seems to me that there's no way out of this dilemma without some kind of collapse I would agree. If you if you imagine, if you, the starting point would be the wealth gap. So, uh, flatline until you reach the one tenth of one percent, and then it goes infinitely up. So imagine that as a tower, that the wealth and power are concentrated in the hands of a very very few people. That is inherently unsustainable. One one cannot fend off death or collapse or entropy. And so it will collapse on its own. And I'm thinking here of a model for localized economies and exchange of resources developed by Michael Tellinger. He calls that he's a South African and he, he calls this model Ubuntu. I am. I'm familiar with are. that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and so he, he's he's not sanguine about it. He agrees with everything. I think, I, well, I can't speak for him. Uh, I don't know him. But but it seems to me he would agree with our critique of capitalism. And, and his measured response seems to be, we don't need to bring that to a halt because it will inherently collapse under its own weight. And in the yeah. meantime, we need to be developing something that makes sense at the local level. And so he's has a model people can sign on to and, and start to develop these local communal exchange of goods and services. And, and he, he's saying we don't have to wait for the thing to collapse and we don't have to hasten it. We can just start. We can just yeah. start. Uh, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, that's a great constructive example. Um, and I think I've even said here before that it's, it's like on some level, it's unethical to be participating in this clown show because of its destructive capabilities yes. um and yes, it's it demeaning is. it's it, it's harmful to so many people in it society is. and around the world um and so opting out is definitely insofar as that's possible is definitely one avenue like at the very least reducing your consumption like come on you know like there's a lot of confusion people think oh china is all is has all these coal-fired power plants China makes shit that they export to everywhere else, right? <laughs> if, if they yeah, wouldn't be right. they, like, we are that's exporting right. our pollution to China basically because of their cheap labor. So it's the yeah, indu the, yeah. the industrialized countries or the you know countries like America and Europe and places like Canada. Our carbon footprint is like off the scale compared to people in Africa and other parts of of the world. Um, and it's that is directly related to our consumption. So what we can do is minimize our consumption, and and it, like like as you're suggesting with the Ubuntu model, if you can opt out of, you know, this destructive society, that that is definitely one option, insofar as it's possible. Yeah, his model, by the way, I remember the name. It's called One Small Town. Um, uh, but yeah, if we stopped consuming, oh, this morning, this morning I saw an old quote from John Lennon. I guess they would all have to be pretty old at this point but this quote was along the lines of if everyone would start demanding peace instead of demanding a new television set we would have peace <laughs> yeah that was a long time ago i'm sure he said that yeah it would be over 40 years yeah now. well there there was a i mean they tried to do a lot of people back in the 60s and 70s tried to do this right um, they did, and 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 I I saw another longer discussion with him, and he was saying what the what the sixties taught us is that this has to be we have we have to continue to dedicate ourselves to it. It's it's like a flower garden; we have to keep watering it. That mm. love love doesn't just continue on its own. We have to continue to love. We have to tend to it as as with a garden. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. We well, I mean. Engaging. I, I don't dispute that. Um, you know, we do have some technology now that we didn't have back then. Like you can actually go off grid and live reasonably comfortably now, um, which was a lot more challenging back then. if you didn't burn trees, um, right. uh, that's good. But um, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, well, we don't, we can't be, none of us are that smart or, or that aware, but I, I, I like the idea that lots of people like you and I are having conversations about what it might look like, because they're going to have to be lots of locally determined solutions. You know, a lot of indigenous knowledge, as I understand it, was incredibly intelligent about the local ecological interconnectedness they knew that if you harvest this at this time of year it's going to affect that mm -hmm. animal and that insect it, so localized intelligence localized awareness and and there's not going to be one model that that goes everywhere but i like the idea that people are having conversations like this one all over the world right now well i i hope so um yeah um i mean i mean the, i think that that the, the the thing that a lot of people need to get through their heads if it hasn't already sunk in is that the system that we live within is a complete and utter disaster like the biggest one in all of human history <laughs> like right. it really completely. it's that bad because yes. because we have yes. completely we have like 
initiated a sixth mass extinction event, right? I mean, it doesn't get right. worse than that, right? The only thing that's worse than that it was would be complete annihilation, annihilation and the extinction of our species, which hasn't happened yet. So um, it's damn bad. So when yep. when you start from that premise, then you start to go like, okay, well, what else? What what could reality look like? Exactly, and it, the hopefully, again, hope is dangerous, but passive. But hopefully, <laughs> you, you you painted yourself into a corner there, didn't you? I did. I really did. But but we can imagine that the new thing is arising, even as the old thing is collapsing, and and that isn't utopian or or naive. It's just to say clearly some people are trying to imagine you know, like michael tellinger like this conversation people are trying to imagine what the alternative would be assuming that we survive the mess that we've made we might not but if we do people are trying to imagine this other paradigm a better more sustainable more just more spiritual paradigm well let, let's for for that Let's start with the assumption that there is enough resources for every single human being on the planet. Yeah. That that includes healthcare, food, shelter, everything. We can yeah. if if the if the world's wealth was was evenly distributed, everyone would be fine for the most Very part, good. you know, setting aside accidents and things like that. Yep. And that's the premise we should start from <laughs> with, with respect to, to the new world. If we is that and and I, like free. because you know when people have their fundamental needs taken care of you know they can spend time to do things like think yes and yes. educate themselves and better their communities and take care of each other or stuff like that exactly. so when is your tell us what what's the status of your book when's it coming out when when is will it be available the book will I don't want to say hope again, but but the plan. <laughs> <laughs> you can't anymore. I'm just kidding. I know it's 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 taken away. Uh, the plan is for it to come out sometime in 2024. We don't have an exact publication date. Okay. It's a small publishing company. It's the one that Hillman used to run, and the there, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of when when the team and the editorial board thinks it's ready. Uh, but my my projected date would be about a year from now what stage of the writing are you at there's there's a lot of structure to it i would say i am about 80 percent through the research and about a third of the way through the writing okay i got a i got a link i gotta send you okay might fit in it's just something I came across recently that I thought was very interesting. This guy who is an actual science fiction writer, but he's sort of developed this theory called, he calls it the enshittification, talking about how social media platforms are born and die and why. And it's really fascinating. Very good. Yeah. Because I do think that, like, however things go down, we have to stay connected. We in the big capital we. Oh, hello. Sorry, I'm back now. Maybe, I, maybe they shut us down already. Yeah, they, they don't like what we're talking about. It's you a know, conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. It is. It was my Wi-Fi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, knows look, it down. Yeah, it's probably the government. I had asked you what stage of the writing you're at. Yes, I'm about a third of the way through. I mean, obviously, there's okay. everything to do at some point. But the structure of the book is there. I, I've cut myself off on research because it's the kind of topic where I could just scour the headlines for the next 10 years and yeah. frantically try and squeeze it all in. But the point of it is not the facts of the current events. It's the framework of how we respond to that. So um, that's the balancing act is I want there to be some good information there, but I also want there to be room for the reflection and the, you know, sort of the, theoretical and and philosophical framework for the book yeah well i mean you'll have to keep us posted and uh if i'm still on youtube i'll let people know about it <laughs> this doesn't bring you down i appreciate it and uh i i know you don't need to hear this but keep up the good work because it does matter that there are some people looking at all of this and not flinching and not disconnecting from it and not not being utopian or naive in their response to it i think it's good to be 
appropriately mm, concerned <laughs> about all this. Uh, what was the word? I'm sorry, you cut out there. Oh, sorry. Uh, appropriately concerned. You know, to, concerned. To okay. Yeah. Yeah. Look away from the shadow of what's happening. I, I think it's tempting to do that. Well, and, uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I'm an Aries rising, so I'm like uh, rushing to uh, where angels fear to tread. You know. So yeah, that's you're willing to self sacrifice, right? That's the yeah sort of like the first into battle, the first to go yeah. down. If it needs to be done, do it, you know. But um, yeah. it, uh, like I said, there's a lot of people just don't want to think about it because it's too depressing. And you know, there there is the potential that there is a miracle occurs, and you know, there's a timeline split or something like that that we don't right. we can't really know. anticipate. You never know. Uh, or some miracle, you know, like uh, alien intervention or something, but we can't rest on our laurels about that. Uh, nobody currently knows how to alter a planetary uh, biosphere, you know, within a few years uh, without, <laughs> well, we just don't know how. Yes, we can't, so, we can't terraform Terra. <laughs> no, so, I mean, you know, uh, that's like way beyond our capabilities. So we can yeah, fairly accurately assume that there's going to be stuff happening in the next few years and decades but anyway uh yes. well thank you it's been uh, it's been fascinating and i'm sure as, as soon as i as soon as we get off i'll start going like oh shit we should have talked about this and that and the other thing we started off by the way talking about secret societies and the freemasons but before we started we, recording we did we did and uh, <laughs> you know we've we've uh, covered a lot yeah we've been all over the place well thank you very much scott you're welcome thank you and uh, I'll be in touch for sure. Oh, I, there is one other thing I wanted to mention, just to have yes. this on the record, if you you got two more minutes, not even two. Oh, no, I'm fine. Um, a lot of people communicate with me privately, mm -hmm. and they will express their more darker perspectives confidentially that they oh. don't typically express publicly to me. That's a very good point. I find it a bit, it's a bit alarming because it makes me think, oh, boy. There's a lot more people out there who are quite pessimistic than we may realize because people just don't want to say it. Yeah, and I, I, with pessimism, I think the the challenge is to avoid the two extremes, right? We don't we don't want to be nihilistic or pessimistic or mm. or fatalistic, but at the same time, we don't want to be naively utopian. So, no, whatever that middle ground is, that's what I'm aiming for. Yeah, I'm just mentioning that to you because, you know, as a psychologist, you deal with people, but um, it's surprise. Mm -hmm. I'm sometimes surprised uh, that a lot of people think like, oh boy, this is not good. Uh, but they don't, they don't really say that to their friends or typically, and they don't, you know, post it on YouTube and stuff. Well, yeah, we're, oddly, we're in an officially optimistic society. Yeah. Which doesn't really help us a lot of the time. I think that's what Hillman was reacting to was that Yes, the hope of, thing. Yeah, hope, hope, and and the what he called the the innocence of of America, the the violence of the lambs, the the ignoring the impact of what we're doing, and the the sort of childlike feeling that it'll all be okay. Right. That's yeah. That's not helpful. Yeah, it's a point. He, by the way, out. was a triple Aries. He had Sun, Moon, Chiron conjunct in Aries. Sun, so he, moon, he would share Chiron your... conjunct in Aries. Oh my God, that's powerful. No wonder he did what he was. did. That's amazing. Yes. What what house uh, was it in? Do you know? In the ninth. Oh my God, that's fascinating. Yep. In, unbelievable. Like, yep. Chiron, that's perfect, right? I mean, honestly, him, yeah. Fits him perfectly. It it really does. He also had um, Pluto conjunct the ascendant from the 12th so a lot of that deconstructing energy was built in as well in, in cancer he had cancer rising unbelievable yeah that's fascinating yeah his chart's interesting there's a well-known astrologer richard charnas who had a video up where he went through hillman's chart they knew each other they were colleagues and friends and he analyzed hillman's chart and and drew out the implications of it but i can't find the video online anymore i think it was pulled down oh huh. Wow. Actually, if you yeah. go whole signs, his his stellium in Aries was in the he also had Mercury in Aries, all in the tenth. If you do whole signs the houses. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. So his career. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Aries is yeah. 
Aries can be tough, you know, um, can get you in trouble. It did um, get him in trouble. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's, it's part of me, but I mean, no, sure. it's not easy because you tend to be, you know, some people can perceive you as being confrontational or whatever. Yeah. And I have it, I have Saturn and Aries in the seventh. So, you know, I, I deal with that energy through the other, but uh, I've, I've tried to become much more friendly to it and own it. And that's why this kind of doesn't scare me. <laughs> yeah. Saturn can yield long-term benefits. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it'll be it's interesting great. to listen to this i like i don't even remember where we went well it's i blame my um gemini and mercury right <laughs> but you know I, th- I, th- I think it has to be light i think it has to touch on all these things because just plowing into it and and sinking into the the pessimism i, I don't know that that's helpful either so maybe it's a counterbalance of mercury and saturn i don't know well look even if there is even if something miraculous happens what we're expressing is is valid because that's our perspective right now right exactly yeah so i mean at the very least we're documenting what we're experiencing here at this point in history and that's kind of what my whole channel is intended to be it's an aquarian diary well said yeah all right thank you (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Me too. Okay. I'll put links in the episode description to any related content, and if you're interested in a reading with me, I'll put a link to that as well. Many sincere thanks to everyone who supports me, especially my YouTube members. Thank you very much. Take care, all the best, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.